Hi, I'm Lisa Williamson, and we're listening to Equine Nutrition number 11, created for our BC Lower Mainland Pony Club. This is feeding in relation to conditioning. So we first have to look at what is the definition of a fit horse versus an unfit horse. So basically an unfit horse is said to be in soft condition. That is the other term for it. Soft condition means unfit. This horse could be physically healthy. He could be, you know, in good physical health, but not fit for work. So by that we mean his muscles are slack, he's overweight, he can't carry out any physical exercise without undue stress. And so you will see sweating, increased respiration, increased heart rate. Uh, he will fatigue more rapidly. And if he's worked in this fatigue state, he could be vulnerable to soft tissue injury. So that is the definition of the unfit horse. So what is a fit horse? A fit horse is said to be in hard condition. So hard condition is another term for fit horse. The horse that is fit or in hard condition will not have any excess fat. He will be muscular. His soft tissues such as tendons and ligaments will be toned and capable of withstanding the strain of work. He will be capable of doing sustained work without any undue sweating or blowing. He will have the energy to exert himself in concentrated bursts of energy without becoming unduly fatigued. Another indicator of a fit horse is that his recovery time upon ceasing exercise will be much shorter than that of a fit horse. So he will return to normal temperature pulse respiration much more quickly. His rest time either between bouts of work or at the end of work will be much shorter to cool him out and return him to a normal temperature pulse respiration. If you are going to make a horse fit, take a horse from an unfit or soft state into a fit state, you, there are a number of steps that you need to do before you embark on a fitness program. So the first thing you should do is have the horse checked by a vet and a farrier. Have the farrier come in, trim the feet, shoe the feet, whatever. Just make sure that the horse is ready to go. Also with the vet, just have the vet do a once over, make sure that anything that needs to be done is done and the horse is in uh, a condition that he is capable of doing work. Take the time to evaluate his weight at that time and then again his overall general condition and then from that establish a feeding program. At the beginning when the horse is in soft condition you will be on a high bulk to low concentrate ratio. So he will be eating more grass and more hay and very little in the way of concentrates or grains. You need to introduce work very gradually depending upon the horse's environment or condition. So if a horse is in a stall all the time or in a stall and a little paddock he won't be able to self-exercise compare that to a horse that is out in a field 24 hours a day, that horse will be self-exercising more. He already is further down the continuum, the line towards fitness. Consider the horse's environment upon embarking on the program and where he is along that continuum. You may, if the horse has been in a stall uh, 24 hours a day or only has access to a small paddock and if he has been off work for a long period of time, you may have to start with just walking, hand walk putting him into turnout in a larger paddock, starting with some lunging, that sort of thing. You also have to be aware of making sure that any changes that you do don't cause soundness problems. Soft tissues will be more susceptible at this time, but also things like the horses will be susceptible to girth galls, saddle galls, because they're sweating more, they're fatter, their tack might rub. So make sure that your saddle fits your horse as well. If this was a saddle that was fitted for your horse when he was in fit condition and now he is quite overweight, his whole body shape may have changed and your tack might not fit him anymore. So once you have ruled out all of those things, once you've embarked on uh, the turnout program, once you've embarked on some walking, you can progress from hand walking to getting on your horse and riding, walking, start to introduce lots of trotting, then small amounts of canter. Once you've done a little bit of canter, you can introduce small fences. But the key is take it slowly, take it gradually. This would be happening over anywhere from a two week to six weeks period, depending upon where you started with, with your horse before you get to the cantering and small fences stage. How do you feed in relation to conditioning? Well, as your program increases or progresses, the feed must be adjusted to produce the muscle and energy required for the job. Any change, as we have said earlier, changes to food must be gradual. 
you're looking at carbohydrates. Carbohydrates can cause insulin and glucose to rise to the higher, highest levels two to three hours after eating. Uh, and then will drop to the lowest levels five hours after eating. Uh, so that can be anywhere from three to five hours after eating. So feeding a large grain meal can push a horse into a hypoglycemic state where he's under fueled. If you feed him at seven in the morning, anywhere from 10 to 12 in the morning, he will be in an under fueled state. Excess carbohydrate can be stored as glycogen in the liver and in the muscle fibers. This leaves it available for anaerobic or aerobic lactic metabolism. Starches are an instant energy food, but again, it depends when you feed the horse and depends further down, like three to five hours later, they can be in the opposite state. Fats are a concentrated source of energy. Uh, they're great for fit horses that are hard keepers. They're also good for horses that get too hot on a high starch diet. Fats are only used in aerobic activity. So the longer the duration of the exercise, the more the fat is burned. So therefore, any aerobic-based exercise program will burn more fat. A byproduct of this is that glycogen stores increase, and this helps the horse to maintain higher blood glucose levels, and it's helpful for horses doing endurance work. Minerals. For horses that work hard, frequently, or for long hours, they will lose electrolytes. Electrolytes must be replaced. So what electrolytes are, are there minerals that are in the horse's body, and they will be lost through work you must replace them. Horses that are fed electrolytes will have a higher rate of urination and so therefore you must make sure that they have access to water at all times. The need for sodium rises as sweat causes sodium loss and this will vary from horse to horse so you're going to need to make sure that your horse has access to salt at all times as well. Selenium deficiency may limit horses performance and may contribute to episodes of tying up so these are all mineral related issues, mineral related issues that will affect your horse that is trying to work, trying to get fit. So ration formulation we talked about a little bit before, but we'll just review that. So as fitness and energy exertion increases, energy intake will also increase. So the energy requirements will be based on the type of work, the intensity of work, the length of the work, the footing and the weather. So how does footing affect your horse's work? Well, Obviously, deeper footings will make your horse work harder, but likewise, very hard footings that have a higher concussive force on your horse will make a change in the trauma to the horse's legs and the mineral requirements as well. So be aware that different types of footing, whether it be very soft or very hard, will increase the energy requirements in your horse in various different ways. As work and fitness increase, grain is a concentrated form of energy that can supply energy requirements, but supplementing fat is also good because it's another concentrated form of energy. You need to match your feed to the type of work being done. So consider energy expenditure. So a 450 kilogram horse will expend about 225 kilocalories an hour at the walk. So as soon as you add trot and canter, this increases tenfold. So now your horse is consuming 2,250 kilocalories kilocalories per hour. Once you start galloping and jumping, this changes the expenditure to 10,350 kilocalories an hour. And if you're doing intense work such as racing or upper level eventing, intermediate and advanced level, 17,550 kilocalories an hour. So very hard work will burn a lot of calories. Um, so you will need to feed your horse accordingly. In order to maintain this same horse at those energy levels, they would need to consume. For the horse that's only walking, burning 225 kilocalories an hour, they would only need, if we're just feeding oats, in addition to your haze and whatnot, 0.1 kilograms of oats would fulfill that requirement, 225 kilocalories an hour. The horse that is trotting and cantering, so therefore burning 2,250 kilocalories an hour, they now need 0.8 kilograms of oats. The horse that's galloping and jumping, burning 10,350 kilocalories an hour, that horse now needs 3.6 kilograms of oats to fulfill that requirement. And the horse that is doing intense work, 17, 1,550 kilocalories an hour worth of work, six kilograms of oats would fulfill that requirement. So you can see that matching the amount of food and the type of food um, to the work being done is very, very important.
So, match a type of food to the work done. Fiber is a slow-release energy, and it is essential to gut health. So, we need to have fiber in the diet all the time, in the system all the time, because it keeps things moving through, but it also is slowly releasing energy. Starch, on the other hand, is an instant energy, but if you feed too much starch, and by starch we're talking about grains, it can cause behavior problems. Um, temperament problems. There's also an increased risk of laminitis. So uh, again, this is a management thing. You need some knowledge here. If you don't feel you have the knowledge to do this, um, talk to your vet, talk to your trainer, talk to your barn manager. Hopefully they will be able to give you some good advice in this area. Oils. Oils are energy dense, but they are a slow release energy. So this helps with the horse that gets a little bit hyper. It helps with the horse that can be a little bit hot. It will give him the energy energy he needs but not all fast release it, it spreads it out over time but with oils you have to make sure that you introduce them gradually and again don't overdo it with oils you can't feed all oils because oils will in excess coat the fiber that the horse needs in its system and if the fiber is coated then the horse cannot access that and that can cause another cascade of events that can be very detrimental to your horse's health talk to a professional about the needs of your horse if you are competing your horse, uh, what do you do on competition day? You will always make sure that your horse has access to water. If you remember that story about Black Beauty and how he ran to the doctor and then had to run back and then they gave him water and he colic, that is sort of old school way of looking at it. New research has shown that the horse, it is more important that the horse be hydrated. And so make sure your horse has water at all times. If he wants to drink, let him drink. For horse doing intense work on competition day, the hay intake should be restricted to about 1.5% of the body weight. Feed hay and grain about four hours ahead of riding and this will allow glucose and insulin levels to stabilize. So that is um, feeding in relation to work. So equine nutrition number 11, here are some questions for you. Again, I'm Lisa Williamson and hopefully you enjoyed that.